Hello, my name is Alana and I'm excited to introduce our speakers for today. Um, we have here Professor Mimi Marziani who teaches election law and policy at the University of Texas School of Law and currently serves as the executive director of the Texas Civil Rights Project. She previously served as the legal director at Battleground Texas, directing the group's voting rights work and overseeing compliance with election law. Before moving to Texas, Ms. Marziani spent several years as counsel for the democracy program of the Brennan Center for Justice at the NYU School of Law, where she litigated election law cases in federal courts across the country, including before the U.S. Supreme Court. Ms. Marziani graduated cum laude from the NYU School of Law and clerked for the magistrate judge, James C. Francis IV of the Southern District of New York. Joining us later is a little logistical issue with the airplane, but <laughs> Misha Saitlin became the Wisconsin Solicitor General in December 2015. He previously served as general counsel in the West Virginia Attorney General's office, where he specialized in litigation, challenging unconstitutional and otherwise unlawful overreach by the federal government. Saitlin graduated summa cum laude from Georgetown University Law School in 2006. At Georgetown, Saitlin served as the president of the student chapter of the Federalist Society and was the articles editor of the Georgetown Law Review. His distinguished resume includes a clerkship for United States Supreme Court Justice Anthony Kennedy. Additionally, he clerked for the Honorable Janice Rogers Brown on the Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia in Washington, D.C. and for the Honorable Je Alex Kaczynski on the Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. Please help me introduce our, welcome our speakers. Thank you. A couple thank yous before I begin. Thank you to everybody at the Federalist Society. I am not a member of the Federalist Society, never have been, probably never will be, but uh, I do really appreciate participating in these events. Uh, thank you to all of you for being here. Thank you. I see a couple of members in particular from my election law and policy class, so I appreciate you guys coming out. So, um, Obviously, there's only one person standing up here, so I'm going to do my best to um, introduce some of the questions that the Supreme Court is weighing right now in the Whitford versus Gill case. And because um, questions of redistricting generally and then party, partisan gerrymandering specifically are complicated, I thought that we could walk through some of the background considerations and legal principles that are um, going to influence the Supreme Court's decision, especially because Misha is uh, in route right now from the airport or soon, I will probably then pause and let you guys ask some questions so that we are then hopefully all at kind of a basic level of understanding before Misha comes in and we can go back and forth a little bit on the case itself. So the, the question presented, well, let me back up. Um, one of the reasons that I am so pleased to be here today is because the Whitford case could have such monumental ramifications for the state of our democracy. And while uh, I have certainly been asked to present a particular point of view, you know, I, my goal is actually to persuade all of you that this case and how you come down on this case actually is not um, neatly capable of being characterized as either progressive or conservative. That really what we're talking about is the health of our democracy, and that's something that all of us as um, Americans uh, worry about and should be very concerned about. And the question in Whitford is whether the um, political party in charge of drawing the maps in Wisconsin, that's the Republican Party, whether they went too far in rigging the system to systematically dilute the voting strengths of people with opposing points of views. And in this case, those people are Democrats, but they don't have to be. And, and this, this question of partisan gerrymandering has vexed us for a long time, and we have indeed seen members of both political parties um, partaking in gerrymanders when it benefits them. 
And um, there, there's not, not a surprise, actually, that gerrymandering has uh, vexed us for so long and that, indeed, we see it on both sides of the aisle. At the end of the day, the term gerrymandering means nothing more than the act of manipulating district lines in an attempt to change the results of an election. And the reason it's been part of our political system for so long, and quite frankly, will probably always be there to some extent, no matter how this case comes out, is because people in power are very inclined to stay in power. I don't care who you are. It is a truism of human beings. And it is also true that gerrymandering is a time-tested tactic to keep the reins of power firmly in control. And in fact, gerrymandering is older than our country and our democracy itself. Uh, at the time of the American Revolution and the founding of our country, our founding fathers were actually specifically concerned by the corrupting effect of what were called rotten boroughs in England. And this was a term used to describe districts, sometimes with no people at all, sometimes with very few people, but that nevertheless had representatives in Parliament. And um, <laughs> simply put, this tactic allowed politicians to stay in power without worrying about pesky things like, oh, the views of their constituents. And so in building our Constitution, our founding fathers took these considerations into account. And our Constitution is designed in many ways to ensure that our elected representatives do indeed have close ties to their constituents and are responsive to popular, democratically expressed will. And it's beyond the scope of this presentation to go into all the ways that our Constitution guarantees that, but at least two ways are through the First Amendment, which preserves our right to robust debate, our right to petition the government for grievances in those ways and more, uh, the freedom of association, all of those things protect also, ultimately, our right to translate political power into representation. And then later, the Equal Protection Clause in the 15th Amendment shored up that structure and guaranteed a, a broader base of equality in that system of representation. And so for this reason, the Supreme Court has repeatedly recognized that gerrymandering poses a unique threat to our system of government and to our democracy. And um, just, just one quote um, from Justice Stevens in 2004, um, a member of American Constitution Society, as am I, called partisan gerrymandering invidious, undemocratic, and unconstitutional. But even though you've had many members of the court, including most recently in our argument, Justice Alito saying that partisan gerrymandering is quote unquote quite troubling, even though you've heard this, honestly, from, from justices across, along the spectrum, the court has really struggled with the question of when to interfere in the redistricting process. And how to do so. And it's particularly struggled with that question when lines are being drawn to give one political party an advantage over another. Uh, there are lots of reasons for this hesitation. The simplest one, and probably the main reason, is that drawing district lines is complex. It is uh, not an answer. It, sometimes people, people uh, <coughs> are inclined to say that we can just draw little rectangles across our states, and that should be the answer to redistricting. But the reality is that that's not how people live. We all live in ways that are messy and complex and ways that develop organically. And um, for that reason alone, the rectangle approach does not work. And it means that there are all sorts of value judgments that have to go into this question of drawing the lines. And it raises, usually, the types of competing interests that usually our political system is best equipped to work out. However, there have been critical moments, and I'm gonna talk about a couple of these in, in a second, when the court has recognized that if and when 
the democratic process becomes so distorted, so <coughs> perverted, that the true will of the people has been systematically suppressed, that our Constitution demands intervention from the federal court. And so uh, we're going to look backwards for a second at some of those times in the past before we look at the Whitford case and ask ourselves, is this one of those moments? Um, I would uh, also encourage folks to think about some of the reasons that this could be appropriate for federal court intervention. I think the number one reason that um, justices, um, again, from both sides of the aisle have recognized in the past, is that we need to be very concerned when our political process has inequality baked into it that distorts the normal channels of political recourse. In other words, when we have superficially entrenched a certain ruling class or a certain segment in power in our society, that's a moment where because of that superficial entrenchment, the democratic process itself will no longer work as an agent of change. And that would be one reason under the political process theory that the federal court should step in. So one of the most important examples of this from our Supreme Court history is the case of Reynolds versus Sims. And that was 1964, landmark case. Alabama at the time had not drawn new lines since the 1900 census, despite massive population changes, including, and this should start sounding familiar, massive growth in urban areas of the states. Because they had failed to draw new lines, the votes of younger, poor, more diverse urban residents were diluted and power had been shifted to the older, richer, whiter um, residents of rural parts of the country. And in the Alabama case, in Reynolds v. Sims, the population variance was so distorted that it was upwards to 41 to 1 ratio of distortion, meaning that the vote of a factory worker in Mobile was significantly diluted vis-a-vis -vis the vote of a farmer in the country. And um, we, we need to understand also that this was absolutely by design. It was meant to preserve the power of the existing lawmakers, and it was meant to keep down the political power of the people themselves, especially and particularly African Americans who had moved and constituted the overriding majority in the cities. So in that moment, the Supreme Court realized it had an obligation to intervene under the Equal Protection Clause. And that was the moment it declared the one person, one vote rule that is probably very familiar to all of us today. And in declaring that rule, um, two things. One, this is very familiar to all of us today. It's something that we all, quite frankly, take for granted. It was extraordinarily controversial at the time, and it actually led to a redrawing of the maps across the entire country. In addition, um, the Supreme Court, understanding the disruptive effect that that rule was going to have, reminded us that something bigger was um, on the line, and that was our democracy. And Chief Justice Earl Warren said, as long as ours is a representative form of government, the right to elect legislators in a free and unimpaired fashion is a bedrock of our political system. He went on to note that full and effective participation by all citizens in state government requires that each citizen have an equally effective voice in the election of members of the state legislature. Modern and viable state government needs and the Constitution demands no less. Uh, fast forward a couple decades, you have also seen the, the Supreme Court stepping in to police the intentional use of racial classifications to distort representation. There's a long and complex history here, but I wanted to quickly highlight a 2006 case Lulak versus Perry that came out of Texas. This is a rich and complicated case having to do with the um, Republican Party of Texas' decision to redistrict in a decade. As part of that case, Justice Kennedy examined Congressional District 23, which then and now stretches from Laredo to El Paso. The lines had been redrawn by lawmakers to protect an increasingly unpopular Republican incumbent. 
and he was that that lawmaker was vulnerable because of a blossoming engagement of the Latino community, particularly in the city of Laredo. Republicans attempt to suppress the political power of that community, and they did so through a method that is now very familiar to us in, in modern redistricting cases. Quite frankly, they cracked the Latino population by dividing Laredo in the middle. They shoved um, part of the Latino community into a different district, and then they widened the district overall to include more parts of rural, whiter West Texas um, in, in an effect to dilute the overall voting strength of the Latino community. Um, the, in doing so, the Republicans tried to pretend that this was still a competitive district, and it did so by moving into the district non-citizen Latinos and or Latinos who were very, very unlikely to actually vote. And this sort of tactic, the cracking apart of um, communities of interest and then packing them somewhere else so that they have a supermajority over here but are spread more thinly over here is um, one of the tactics that's an issue in the Wisconsin case. Here, Justice Kennedy saw through the charade and while this, this district, CD23, was struck down under the Voting Rights Act, he left us with some insight into the work of the Equal Protection Clause in this area of the law. And he specifically noted that he was bothered by the evidence of political game playing, saying, and I quote, the state took away the Latinas' opportunity because Latinas were about to exercise it. This bears the mark of intentional discrimination. Even if we accept the district court's finding that the state's action was taken primarily for political and not racial reasons, the state not only made fruitless Latinos' mobilization efforts, but acted against those very people who were becoming politically active, dividing them with the district line in the middle of the radar. And so uh, this short history lesson then brings us to the Whitford case. This is a moment where the court is confronting a similar type of political inequity. The intentional partisan rigging of the system that is so severe to entrench one party in power. Uh, this is perfect. And so, uh, in, indeed, the problem of partisan gerrymandering is one that has become more and more acute in recent years. Um, there's, there's a couple things driving this, um, but the, one of the most significant is the fact that voter data is becoming uh, more abundant, much more specific and tailored, and we have algorithmic modeling technologies that are much more precise and are able to capture that big data and model voters' behavior. And so that leaves us today with a situation where politicians have the same age-old and probably inherent and inescapable drive to stay in power once they have gained power, but they have a, super, um, a supercharged way to do so through these new sophisticated map drawing technologies, and that allows um, lawmakers to very successfully put partisan interests above concerns about voters, their viewpoints, and communities of interest. And so in other words, we're looking at a 21st century version of the same rotten boroughs problem. Politicians are picking the voters rather than the other way around. And so uh, that brings us directly to uh, Whitford, which of course Misha just argued before the court on behalf of the state of Wisconsin. I'm just going to take a, a moment on this case and then turn it over if he's, if he's ready to go. Um, I, and, and I want to take my moment to highlight just how good this technology has gotten. So in 2010, Wisconsin lawmakers shelled out significant sums of money to retain expert map drawers. They used it to buy voting data and they used it to create modeling programs to predict voting data and ultimately and successfully entrench a Republican majority, including and especially in situations 
where Republicans were concerned that they could not actually get the support of a majority of voters in the state. And so um, in order to still comply with the one person, one vote rule, what uh, had to happen as a matter of basic math is you have to then create a map where people with progressive viewpoints are packed into the fewest number of districts where they will uh, elect a candidate of choice with very high margins. And this is uh, in Wisconsin, as is around the rest of the country, um, not exclusively, but predominantly in urban areas. Conversely, the remaining progressives are then distributed among the other districts across the state. They are then um, diluted in small enough numbers so that it would be almost impossible to overcome the conservative vote. Uh, it worked. It was um, extraordinarily successful. So in 2012, Republicans won a minority of the statewide vote, not just about 40, 48.6%, uh, but ended up getting 60 seats out of the 99 seat assembly. So, uh, 48.5% of the vote versus essentially 60% of the seats. Um, on the flip side, in 2014, Democrats then got around 48% of the vote, but got just 36 seats out of that 99 seat assembly. The district court in Wisconsin looked at this, looked at the, the uh, other voluminous evidence that was presented, and found that the maps were unlawful. It said that the maps discriminated against people with certain viewpoints and prevented them from translating their voting power into the type of fair and effective representation guaranteed by the Constitution that, um, that, that was an underscored in that Reynolds case we talked about just a second ago. And the district court reached this finding after concluding that Wisconsin lawmakers had, number one, a clear intent to discriminate against voters with different viewpoints than themselves. Number two, that they had indeed achieved a large and durable discriminatory effect, which had the effect of entrenching themselves in power. And then three, could not point to any other valid justification for drawing the map in the way that they did. And so, the question now before the U.S. Supreme Court is whether the district court was right or not. Um, and, and more fundamentally, the question before the U.S. Supreme Court is whether we have, yet again, as we saw in Reynolds, as we've seen in cases like LULAC, reached another point where the threat to our democracy and the threat to all of our ability to, um, to have fair and effective representation is so threatened that this warrants federal court involvement. And so I could not be more delighted now to um, hand the stage over to Misha, which, as you heard, in addition to his glowing resume, um, just got, um, didn't quite get off the plane from DC after arguing the case, but is not, not too, far, uh, too far away from the argument earlier this month. Thank you so much for what I assume was a nice introduction, although I wasn't <laughs> here for that. Uh, I had all kinds of flight delays this morning. I'm actually also surprised that we have as many people here as we do, as I figured you all would be hungover from celebrating the awesome World Series. <laughs> <laughs> uh, obviously, I'm very excited. Very excited World Series. Game 7 wasn't that exciting, but I'm sure the people here didn't mind having the right kind of, uh, you know, nice, comfortable feeling throughout the game. Um, and again, so. I guess I'm going to give a little bit of overview of the arguments that we made at the Supreme Court um, for the validity of our maps. And I didn't, a little bit disadvantaged because I didn't hear all of the points that the professor was making, I guess, but there were a couple of things that, that were said that I, I think are not uh, fully reflected in, in what the record was in that case and what the actual current state of gerrymandering is, and I'll talk about a little bit about that uh, at the end. So 
I'm not sure how much background was given uh, with regard to political gerrymandering in particular. Uh, what, what, did we discuss like beef and, and things of that sort? Not really. Yeah. So I, heard, I guess you heard a little bit about um, about um, Reynolds and the one person one vote context. One person one vote is fairly easy to administer, uh, and the, the the neutral base lot is obvious. That one person one vote. So the challenge that's been for the last thirty years that the Supreme Court has been a little a, a little or more than a little depending on justice uncomfortable with political gerrymandering, but. There's, people have had a problem pinpointing exactly what they don't like about it. Because there isn't the one person, one vote problem. And everyone knows politicians are political. So says it would be uh, quite naive to have a rule that said you can't have politics influencing what politicians do. You need to have some objective neutral baseline against which to measure whether you've done something untoward or unconstitutional. And what has happened over the last 30 years is that plaintiff after plaintiff has come along to the Supreme Court and they have repeatedly failed in this mission. Uh, originally in the uh, this first issue first came up to the Supreme Court in the Bandemer case. And there um, some justices thought they had come up with a legal standard uh, which was very similar to the legal standard that the plaintiffs uh, urged here which is discriminatory intent, discriminatory effect, and, and justification. Now, as the Supreme Court, as the justices in, in Bandit or the duality uh, recognized in that case, uh, partisan intent isn't really a meaningful inquiry because you're always going to have partisan intent because politicians, you know, no surprise are political. Now, with regard to partisan effect, uh, the, the Bandemer plurality couldn't come up with exactly what, the, what that would look like, but they said it had to be really extreme. And they said, of course, we'll be able to figure this out. And, you know, and so then there was litigation for about 20 years, and courts didn't find a single uh, political gerrymander. Actually, there was one political gerrymander that one trial court found. They found that uh, in a certain, a particular state, uh, that the the Republicans had been gerrymandered out, so they couldn't possibly win uh, any seat, any um, uh, judicial elections. And it was the same kind of arguments that you just heard. It was they packed and cracked the voters such that it would be absolutely impossible for Republicans to ever win judgeships. District Court issued that decision. Two days after the decision issues, the Republicans won every single judgeship in the state. So the, the Fourth Circuit then vacated that decision, and that was the only example in the 20 years between Vandermeer and the next time the Supreme Court faced this issue in B that it actually found a, an unconstitutional, that any court had found an unconstitutional political adjournment. So the court surveys what's happened over 20 years. And the court, and, and there was a lot of reactions from various justices. Four justices, uh, with an opinion written by Justice Scalia, joined by uh, Justice O'Connor, who had previously taken uh, the, the same position in, in Bandit, said, the experience shows that you just can't figure out what would be an unconstitutional gerrymander. Uh, this, this partisan effect standard is too vague, and 20 years of litigation is enough. To, for us to conclude that there's just no judicially manageable standards. This is not like one person, one vote, which is fairly easy to identify. This is some big, how much politics is too much thing, and courts shouldn't be in the business of doing vague rules that have no core. Uh, Justice Kennedy wrote a separate opinion, uh, and he agreed with the pluralities written by Justice Scalia's critique of all of the tests that have been proposed, including the Bandemer test. And he said, well, but 20 years is not a long time in the life of the law. Maybe some standard will come along someday where the courts will be able to identify a limited and precise set of circumstances where uh, partisan gerrymandering is truly illegal. And then some dissenting justices proposed various different tests, but they couldn't agree on, on what test. There were three different tests proposed in the dissent. Fast forward a couple more years. Uh, we have a case called LULAC, which I believe was referenced. Uh, in an amicus brief proposed by, uh, uh, written by a couple of social scientists, um, they proposed a standard called partisan symmetry, which is kind of the notion that if you um, get a certain election results, and then if you have a hypothetical election, how many seats would the other party win? Justice Kennedy went out of his way in LULAC to criticize partisan symmetry as not the kind of neutral standard that he was looking forward to um, in Vith when he said maybe someday the life of the law will figure out some standard. Fast forward to um, just a couple years ago, there was a 
a, a challenge to Wisconsin's uh, maps. The plaintiffs proposed as their central test the very challenge that was left over in Vandermore and Veep. They had to answer the, the critical question, how much politics is too much? And having no better ideas, they went to the same ideas that, that the amicus brief that Justice Kennedy had criticized in Lulay as partisan symmetry. And they proposed one particular metric to measure partisan symmetry called efficiency gap. Then there was a four-day trial on this efficiency gap concept. We presented a lot of problems with the efficiency gap, not only Justice Kennedy's critiques, but also various operational critiques, such that it wouldn't be a limited and precise standard. Uh, the, the trial court ruled two to one against us, uh, and then went, we went up to the Supreme Court, and we were raising a lot of the same critiques of, of um, the efficiency gap test. And plaintiffs, to our surprise, said, you know what, efficiency gap meant. We're just going to say that partisan gerrymandering is bad. There's the efficiency gap uh, test. We don't really defend that. But here's some other social science tests that could measure partisan effect in some other way. And we're not going to tell you which test is better or worse. But the court should just say that partisan symmetry is the way to do it, contrary to what Justice Kennedy said in LULAC. And the court shouldn't opine on which test should be done. Now, we had a couple of critiques of this brand new thing that was sprung on us in the Supreme Court. One is that it's just completely too uncertain. At least if you had the efficiency gap test, a legislature could maybe plan for that, could maybe draw maps with the goal of having a small efficiency gap within the parameters of politics, which politicians do. And you know, perhaps the efficiency gap standard could be set so high that it wouldn't just wipe out a third of all maps. Um, but in this new world that plaintiffs were pitching to the Supreme Court, where you just could pick any social science metric that is loosely related to the concept of the partisan symmetry, um, it, map drawers wouldn't have any idea um, what would happen when their map was challenged. And of course it would just be judge roulette, because you had no limited or precise standard, the plaintiffs would propose their favorite social science metrics. The defendants would propose their favorite social science metrics, and the judges would somehow, based on no intermediary standard, have to pick a winner. And, and as real politics would know, you're going to end up with maps being struck down based on what two out of three judges you end up drawing. Uh, second point we made was related to uh, Justice Kennedy's um, opinion in, in LULAC, which is that the entire concept of partisan symmetry has absolutely no grounding <coughs> in the Constitution or the nation's system. When the Supreme Court adopted the one person, one vote, uh, standard in cases like veterans. They were drawing upon a very rich body of founding era thought about how one person, one vote was central to the concept of the, of the uh, union that they were creating. We said in our briefs, we are not aware of a single historical source, not one, not one person from the time of the founding or the drafting of the 14th Amendment that said the partisan symmetry was even desirable, let alone something akin to the one person, one vote. And when it came back from the other side, both in the, both in the merits brief by the plaintiffs and in their numerous amicus brief, was deafening silence. They were not able to find one source that supported uh, their notion of partisan symmetry, which is how they were attempting to answer the central uh, critique uh, that the Supreme Court had set out before in partisan gerrymandering cases, which is that you need some neutral principle to determine how much politics uh, is too much. And a final point we made about these tests is they are uh, purposely jerry-rigged to favor Democrats over Republicans. And this is, this is what I mean. You heard a little bit something about communities of interest. The way the district usually works is you want to keep communities of interest together. But in fact, in the real world, uh, Democrats have chosen to cluster into cities like Austin, like Madison, Wisconsin. So what you have is a situation where if you draw maps in a, in a way that doesn't focus on politics, so you have a court drawing a map. You're going to end up with partisan symmetry scores favoring Republicans. And we saw this in Wisconsin. For example, you heard uh, the professor say you know, that there was this bad result under the new map, that the Democrats won 48 percent, uh, Republicans got 48.5 percent of the votes, and they got 60 seats under the legislative draw map. Under the immediately prior map, which is a court draw map, because we had a divided uh, um, government in Wisconsin in 2000. Um, Democrats won 50% of the vote, and, the, and the Republicans still got 60 seats. You can see the results under the court map 
and the legislative law draw map were almost identical. They were slightly more favorable to Republicans. And that's, of course, a reflection of the fact that Democrats have uh, inefficiently packed themselves by their geography in cities, so they just have a, a natural disadvantage uh, under, under our one, one first-past-the-post system. So what comes from that if you adopt a test based on a partisan symmetry standard? Well, what happens is, what happens when Republicans are in control of the legislature and choose to politically gerrymander, as politicians tend to do? You have exactly what happened in Wisconsin. You have a natural symmetry that is very favorable to Republicans, and it's nudged a little bit more, and then you get these really high partisan symmetry scores. But what happens when Democrats do the same thing? When Democrats have control of the legislature and the governorship, and they want to district for partisan advantage? We know that from our neighbor to the east, Illinois, which has, I think, widely acknowledged by critics of partisan gerrymandering as the most partisan gerrymandered Democrat state. Under a, the neutral map that they had for a little while, Republicans had a very serious advantage because Democrats are very clustered in Chicago. When Democrats gained control of the, of the legislature, what they did was they very aggressively gerrymandered Chicago into a pizza pie, basically splitting up communities' interests as much as possible to try to create as many Democrat districts as they could. But remarkably, that egregious Democrat gerrymander, which all the amicus briefs uh, in favor of the plaintiffs in the Supreme Court criticized, scores as either neutral or, get this, pro-Republican. In fact, the plaintiff's expert did a study of what he considered to be the 17 worst maps in the last 30 years. 16 out of those 17 were coded as Republican gerrymanders, one was coded as a Democrat gerrymander, and that was a plan in Florida from the 1970s. So unless one wants to have a naive view that somehow Republicans are more nefarious, it's very clear that the partisan symmetry concept is being pushed by the special interest groups that is being pushed now, precisely because it would only take down Republican plans, and it would never, as a practical matter, take down Democrat plans. Now, just um, uh, one minor response to something I heard uh, the professor say when I came in, which is this kind of... I consider it to be a scare tactic notion, the partisan symmetry, uh, that uh, partisan gerrymandering is getting worse. Um, while that certainly is an intuitive statement because we think technology gets better and people use technology uh, to make things better, the data actually doesn't bear that out, and that's plaintiff's own data. The plaintiff's expert did a comprehensive study from 1970 to 2014, and the reason he started in 1970 was because Maps were just done so differently before the one person, one vote requirement, the prior data is not particularly meaningful. So this is the plaintiff's expert that is studied from 1970 to 2014. And if you look at the chart in that study, and I pointed it to this at oral argument, uh, it shows that the partisan symmetry was worse, more, par more partisan gerrymandered in, in 1972, the first year under the 1970 maps, than 2014. So this notion that partisan gerrymandering is somehow is getting worse is belied by the very expert that plaintiffs used in their case. And I, I think it shows that a lot of this kind of attempt to get the Supreme Court to now accept partisan symmetry, whereas they previously rejected, is based on false scare tactics. Um, and it's, it's rather ironic, because the entire approach that the plaintiffs and the supporters are urging are based on social science. But that same social science demonstrates that partisan gerrymander has not actually gotten worse under their own data sets. So you have a situation where social science is being urged as the Rosetta Stone, the solution to this problem, but then the scare tactics are not supported by the social science. So um, I'll talk a little bit about the oral argument. The oral argument, a little to my disappointment, broke down about partisan lines. Uh, you know, Justice, Chief Justice Roberts asked the plaintiffs, uh, plaintiffs um, isn't, you know, isn't this social science gobbledygook? You know, Justice you know, Kagan asked, asked questions about how great the social science. Justice Breyer asked a three minute long question um, <laughs> that had like tons of parts and not one I wanted to answer all the parts. You know, Justice Kagan let me get through half of the answer on one of the six parts of Justice Breyer's question. So that's, you know, that, and then, you know, there was a couple of funny moments at the argument. Um, uh, Justice Gorsuch was also criticizing the fact that we had all these different social science metrics tests that I had talked about, and he compared it to like his secret recipe for his steak rub, 
I had a little bit of turmeric here or whatever, but I'm not going to tell you what the recipe is. And you know, I thought, obviously that's kind of a, you know, a, seems like a silly example, but I think it, it actually makes an important point, is that if you're going to have something that's going to revolutionize district in this country, and make no mistake about it, it would be a revolution. Uh, the plaintiffs, uh, under the plaintiff's test proposed below, one third of all maps, almost all Republican maps, by the way, would be struck down. Um, almost no Democrat has to be struck down, uh, but still one third. And that was when they had a particular efficiency gap test that they were counting. Now that they have abandoned that specific test and said you can bring any social science metric related to partisan symmetry that you want, you're going to have more maps struck down. So I think if you're going to have a distributing revolution imposed by the courts, it should be far more limited and precise, to use uh, Justice Kennedy's words. It should not be a steak rub kind of thing. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Are we ready for questions? Or do, you want to, do you want to speak for a Yeah, let me, do, let me just do. Yeah, go ahead. Um, you know, so the first thing is, I think I agree with like 85% of, of what you said, including Justice Breyer's problems with me. Asking questions, <laughs> but um, you know the couple points I just wanted to make in quick rebuttal. You know, one um, in constitutional law, because of the nature of the Constitution and because of the nature of real life, we rarely have tests that are as limited and precise as maybe we would want, all want in the best world. And in this situation, we are actually presenting, there's a three-part test being presented by the plaintiffs. And part of that is the predominant intent that is a very common thing for the court to look at under constitutional and civil rights law. Second is this idea that there's no valid justification. Again, very common idea from constitutional civil rights law. And the third, and where everybody keeps getting stuck is this idea of how do we measure effect? How do we figure out when, I think you put it really well, when the, um, there's too much partisanship that's been injected in the process. And, um, you know, I, I actually really, this stuff does get kind of complicated. I do encourage people to read the briefs. Um, what the plaintiffs are arguing is that there are a number of different metrics that will have to be weighed by courts. Again, this is something that is not uncommon in many areas of law. One is this idea that you're showing durable effects, that you are seeing the consistent result in the elections time after time, regardless of swings in voters' actual preference. The efficiency gap is a is one measure that has been endorsed by a full range of political scientists. Um, you know, I, I guess maybe we can say all political scientists are liberal, liberal or Democrats, but I'm not sure there's any evidence to back that up. And there's a whole range of expert, te expert, expert testimony, mathematics experts, political science experts, um, so on and so forth that can then look at a particular map and run all sorts of tests and tell us what's happening. The, the bottom line, though, is you know, every time I hear someone say, well, you know, we can't rely on this political science gobbledygook, the number one reason that all of you should be skeptical when you hear that is because people pay so much money for said political science gobbledygook to help them draw the maps in the first place. And if that is worthless, and if indeed the exact same inputs that are going into the map in the first place have no value, then query why very, very intelligent people across the country have been paying quite so much money for that technology to draw their maps in the first place. So um, with that, um, maybe do you want to, we can both sit or stand and you know, I can sure folks have some questions. Yeah. Question question. <laughs> yeah, are y'all ready for questions? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah. So, does anybody have any quick questions? I know, I know. Does <laughs> so anybody have any quick questions? Um, so, in the 2012 uh, elections, like broadly, more people voted uh, for the Democratic member of Congress 
in their individual districts across the country than the Republican candidate, but the Republicans still got a large majority in the, in the Congress. Um, it seems to have the potential to take place uh, in the states as well. Would you say that that might be a line, that if a minority of votes produce a majority of seats, would that be a fair place to draw a line? Well, that, you know, that was the, um, the very test that was proposed to the Supreme Court in the Beat case, which is the one that came after Bandemar. Uh, that one got zero. Zero justice about it. Um, so I think that has significant problems. I think one of the clearest is uh, the national political geography, our Cortron map, immediately prior to this one, would have egregiously failed that. Democrat, you know, Democrats got four, they got 39 seats and they got 50% of the vote under a court trial map because they are so naturally packed in Milwaukee and Madison. So I think that, among other problems, is why none of the justices in the Supreme Court were attracted to that particular test, which, you know, yeah. was proposed. And, and actually, if you study elections, uh, I, I agree with that completely. And, and one of the other interesting quirks is if you study elections, in fact, um, kind of regardless of maps and everything else, because of the way that votes are usually cast and counted in the single member district system, that is that there's other reasons that it that the one to one comparison doesn't actually work. Usually, most scientists say that you, you know, if somebody gets 52 percent of the votes, they should actually be expected to get 54 percent of the seats because of those kind of various funky parts of the system that are built into it. I didn't mean to be dismissive. I just, you know, that, you know, that no, I mean, because that's, that's what most people think, yeah, right? Yeah. I mean, that's kind of a lot of the uh, In recent years, Iowa seems to be getting a fair amount of press for having a standard that seems relatively nonpartisan compared to other states. Has that standard come up in the current Supreme Court case at all? And if so, how is it regarded? I don't know if Iowa has, but, you know, but remember, what's being proposed is a three-pronged test. And so if you have... I can't remember offhand what Iowa does, but if you have, for instance, an independent commission, so it's not the lawmakers themselves drawing the lines, um, I, I would hope that any test the Supreme Court comes with, or the federal courts develop, would say that that would basically be a safe harbor, that they then you would remove the intent part of the analysis, and all of us could depend on that. Right. So Iowa uses a Iowa uses a, a commission that proposes to the legislature, and the legislature, just as a matter of custom, seems to adopt it. I, you know, one of the things that, you know, obviously uh, most commission plans would, would survive on your uh, plaintiff's test because of the partisan intent. But I do think it's important since the partisan effects inquiry, the social science metrics, are going to be driving really uh, the legality of legislative draw maps. I think it's important to see what happens when commissions draw maps. And what we saw from the data from the own expert is a lot of times plaintiffs, uh, these, these ones drawn by, by, commission, by commission, not necessarily Iowa, but like California and, and, and some other states uh, and Michigan, have come up with, with, with maps that by happenstance would flunk the, the social science metrics. So to me that shows that the social science metrics, what they're finding isn't egregious partisan gerrymandering. What they're finding is something else. They're detecting uh, voters being grouped into cities or something else because if, if it really was something so egregious, then you wouldn't be having court draw maps like the Wisconsin prior one failing, or commission draw maps like the Michigan one or the California one failing. They, would, they wouldn't be having this high level of false positive of the social science metrics. We're actually measuring for the thing that we are concerned about. And, and I do want to point out, I mean, one of the things that's hard is all these things are going to exist on a spectrum, right? So if you're looking at something like an efficiency gap, there's going to be a spectrum on it. And I think the idea of one map failing or not is going to be determined on whether you draw the line here or whether you draw the line over here. And so there's lots of evidence that the Wisconsin map were all the way over here. Um, but obviously, if you draw the line more over here, more maps would, would fail. If you draw over here, you're going to get those really bad outliers. Th that's obviously true, but I will point out that, you know, again, the, you know, remember I give the stats 16 out of 17 were, of the 17 most egregious ones, the ones that the most looked the most gerrymandered, were Republican ones. Ten of those 17 were core draws or commission draws. So yes, Wisconsin's map was one of the seven that was that was that was felt in the outlier. But when, when, you have, when you have social science metrics that are capturing almost more than 50% false positives, you're measuring the wrong thing, whatever that is. Yeah, I'm just kind of thinking of the line that I burned like very 
our one session for the Oklahoma State Legislature. <laughs> for the Oklahoma State Legislature. And one of the things that I know is that very much of a majority Republican state, but a lot of the votes are going to be closed because things weren't decided strictly. It probably is a case where you got a one side legislature that's happened, but it was it was decided more on like city versus rural lines, urban versus rural lines, more than it even was Democratic versus Republican. Lines. So I guess my question is on the standards that you were talking about, where the third standard is the social sciences, and the first two like the uh, the justification and stuff. And you were talking earlier about keeping these community interest groups together. Isn't that kind of a way out of that? Like if you say the reason why we're drawing it is because we want to keep the city together, doesn't that like justify the map or that second uh, element, or is there something else there? Well, so the problem is that you know that that is the way you know the plan the plaintiffs have, have pitched their justification problem. The problem is that you could keep communities of interest together and then uh, and get the same and get the same thing. So. And because of this computer technology, you know, that the pleasure rightly pointed out, uh, the the plaintiffs could always draw an alternative map that's going to keep communities of interest together, but will will score better on partisan symmetry metrics. So in the real world, that problem, the justification problem, will never actually save a map. It certainly sounds good, and you want to be able to justify. But because of this technology, and because plaintiffs behind the litigation will be able to just use the same software to be like, hey, give me communities of interest together, but less partisan results. They'll be able to do that, and so, and then they'll also always be able to win the partisan attack because politicians are, pol are politicians. So in the end, the, if the Supreme Court rules against us and rules for the plaintiffs, the trials in the real world won't really have much to do with, with partisan and tender justification. It'll all be a fight of social science metrics, which you know maybe partisan, some partisan gerrymandering a significantly enough problem that the court should just swallow that. I don't think they should, but I don't. I think it would be a mistake to think that the justification problem or the intent problem is really going to ameliorate that problem. I think if you're gonna, if the wolf comes as a wolf, you just have to like swallow that. That it's going to be these social science metrics. Yeah, I, I will say. I mean, the, the fact, the also fact of the matter is, we don't we don't really know because what we have right now, when you saw us Wisconsin is you did not have extensive evidence, and, and you're going to know the record way better than the legislative record, but you know, I, I haven't seen any sort of extensive evidence that there was a lot of debate about all of these other factors, that there was a really, um, there's lots of evidence that there was a single-minded, predominant intent to draw a map along partisan lines. And, and so, you know, I, I think we don't actually know um, how it would fare if you have a, a legislature that says, look, I mean, we debated this for three months and we were talking about communities of interest and we were talking about, um, you know, business communities and we were talking about rivers and mountains and all these other things like that. I mean, that, that, that was not the record and that's not the record in front of the Supreme Court. All right, well, with that, we have to wrap up. So let's thank our speakers. Thank you.